In this video, we're going to look at the various ways the petroleum industry, so that's the crude oil industry, gets the most from the crude oil. So we'll start with the short chain hydrocarbons. You can see I've written there that these are used as fuels. So I've chosen three that you're probably familiar with. So the brown one is obviously methane, and we use that um, in domestic gas appliances. So that will completely combust in oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. The orange one is an example of um, a liquefied gas. So that's butane gas, which is liquefied and put into bottles. So you'd be familiar with gas bottles when you're camping, possibly, or if you have a caravan. Uh, they use bottled gas, which is typically propane or butane. So this equation is for butane. Um, and it will completely combust in oxygen and again form carbon dioxide and water. The green one is octane, um, using this example to represent the type of reaction that would occur in the combustion of petrol. It's also worth mentioning at this point that if there isn't enough oxygen present, we get what's called incomplete combustion. So I've used butane to demonstrate this. So the first equation, we haven't produced carbon dioxide, we've produced carbon monoxide and water. And in the second equation, we formed carbon itself. So that would be apparent by black smoke because we're forming soot particles um, instead of um, an oxide of carbon. So this occurs when there is insufficient oxygen to combine with the fuel. We're now going to look at three different ways that the petroleum industry gets the most from the crude oil. So the first method we're going to look at is called cracking. So I've chosen C12H26. So this is a fairly long alkane molecule. Now the problem with long chain alkanes is they don't combust very easily. They've got very high boiling points, so they're not as useful as the shorter chained um, alkanes. So what they do is they heat it up to a very, very high temperature in the presence of a catalyst, and the catalyst they used is called zeolite. And what that does is it breaks one of these carbon-carbon single bonds in the chain. So effectively they crack the chain. Now it's up to you where you crack the chain. So if you're just asked to write a general equation, suggest some possible products of this reaction, you can crack it wherever you like. And that's the reason why there are lots of different possible products um, from this reaction, because you can crack this chain, this carbon-carbon, uh, these bonds, anywhere you want. Sometimes the question will be phrased where it tells you um, one of the products, so it, effectively it's forcing you um, to crack it in a certain place. So let's just crack it down the middle, shall we? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we'll crack it here. So I've written up the, the exact half of C12H26. So that would look like this, C6H13. So effectively we've made two of these. So if you have a look at that, there's obviously something wrong with this. And hopefully you can see that it's at this side here. So this carbon atom here, is um, short of a bond. So you need four bonds on each carbon. Now both of them are in that situation. So what happens is if we steal a hydrogen from this one, we would make C6H14. So effectively we'd make that. And that means that goes down to H12. So that would be, let's just knock these off so you can see, we're going to end up with those. I'll just lose this two now. So hopefully you can see from these molecular formulae that what we've made is an alkane and an alkene. So that's what you need to remember for the exam. When you crack a long hydrocarbon chain, you make an alkane and an alkene. So the alkane, because it's shorter, 
is going to be more useful. The alkene, these are very, very useful compounds because you can react them with lots of different things and make lots of different substances from them. You could also feed that into the polymer industry and make polymers from that as well. So you've turned um, a sort of not very useful hydrocarbon into two much higher value substances. So I'm introducing you to the RON number, which stands for the research octane number. So if you look at this straight chained alkane, this is heptane, that's given an RON value of zero. The branched alkane, so this is one, two, three, four, five, so pentane, we've got three methyl groups on carbon number two and number four. So this would be 224 pentane. That's got an RON value of 100. So you can see straight away that obviously branching increases the RON value. And I've written up here, the higher the RON value, the more efficient the combustion. So if you think about petrol that goes into a car, um, this typically has an RON value of 95 is the RON value for regular unleaded fuel. Um, you can buy fuels with higher RON values. Um, you can buy um, super unleaded petrol, which would have 97 RON and 98 RON. I think there might even be a 99 RON. So these fuels obviously contain more of these branched um, alkanes and less of the unbranched. So the higher the RON value, the more efficient the combustion. Now I'm going to try and attempt to explain to you how um, RON values help petrol engines run more efficiently. So we're going to look at, the, this is the um, piston and the cylinder of a car's engine. And basically this rotates round and pushes the piston up and down and this up and down motion is transferred into circular motion which is transferred to the wheels. Now there's one part of the engine cycle where this piston moves up and compresses this fuel air mixture that's inside the cylinder and basically what you want it to do is to compress to such an extent I'll just move the um, piston up now. So if we imagine the piston is right up here now. I'll just extend that rod there. So the fuel air mixture is now squeezed into this tiny space here. At that point there, the spark, this is supposed to represent the spark plug, the spark will ignite and basically it will ignite the fuel air mixture inside that space there and then that will push the piston down and give us some um, motion. So the fuel has to be able to withstand this compression stroke, that's what that's known as, the compression stroke. Now the problem with fuels that have low RON values is they aren't very good at withstanding this compression. So instead of combusting right up here, they'll combust so that when the piston's down there. So effectively, the engine um, won't be as efficient because as soon as that fuel combusts, the piston wants to move, is going to be forced back down again. So you're not getting the maximum energy um, from the, um, the cycle of the engine. So I hope that made sense, but that explains um, the link between the RON value and this um, combustion under compression. So, like I said before, this information feeds into the second process the um, petroleum industry uses to get the most from the crude oil, and this is known as isomerization. So, remember, straight chain alkanes, these have low RON values. So they aren't going to combust very efficiently. They're basically going to combust too soon in the compression cycle. So if we can turn this into a branched isomer, then we are going to increase the RON value. 
So basically, all we have to do in this equation is turn this into a branched isomer. So if this is octane, the easiest one to go for would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and put one branch on like that. And that's absolutely fine because you haven't changed the number of carbons or hydrogens. You've just turned it into a branched isomer. So this has got a higher RON value. The final process we're going to look at is called reforming. So we've just seen that branched isomers have higher RON values. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is hexane, straight chain hexane. It's going to have a low RON value, won't combust very efficiently. So this is slightly different to isomerization. So instead of forming um, a branched isomer, reforming actually produces cyclic isomers. So there's an example of what we can do with that. So instead of having straight chain hexane, we turn it into cyclohexane. Now, if you know your general formula, this is CNH2N plus 2, this is CNH2N. So we've lost two hydrogens. So to balance that, we also need an H2 molecule in that equation. So this is cyclohexane, and this has got a higher RON value. It's going to combust more efficiently. The hydrogen is a very, very valuable product. It can be um, fed into uh, processes as a fuel. It can be used as a feedstock for chemical processes, and so on. So you've turned... Um, uh, a low value product or lower value product into much higher value products here. And as you've just seen, there are various other products that could be formed from hexane, so it wouldn't just be cyclohexane. Now, reforming can also produce aromatic hydrocarbons, so the classic example is benzene. This has a formula of C6H6. So if we start, if we remember we started out with C6H14, effectively there are eight hydrogens um, that we need to account for. So to balance this reforming equation, we would get four moles of H2. So reforming produces cyclic hydrocarbons aromatic hydrocarbons, and also hydrogen. Well, I can't turn down the opportunity to tell you one of these classic chemistry jokes. So if that's benzene, what's that? And it's obviously Mercedes benzene. <laughs>